Let's go ahead and uh, pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. There's a lot going on at Journey Church, and what a blessing it is to be a part of a family that is alive, that is excited, that is on the move. And Lord, today we pray that you would use the story that we are about to read to ignite our hearts and continue that kind of momentum for us, both corporately and as individuals. Would you use it as a moment to really unlock via the story of Esther, the potential that's within our heart, the timing that you have for us. So Lord, help us to focus, help us us to understand and apply your word today in Jesus name. And everybody says, amen. amen. So there's a couple, there's a phrase and a word that I want you to grasp today. The first phrase is for such a time as this, for such a time as this, it's one of the defining moments and defining sentences of the story we're going to be reading in the book of Esther today. But also I believe it is timely for us that God's called you here. You're here on purpose and for a reason this very morning for such a time as this. And the second one is the word potential. Can you say that with me? That was pretty weak. Y'all didn't have much potential and you're saying of the word potential. One more time, potential. God has potential in your hearts and in your minds that he wants to unlock. And I believe he's going to do that today through this story as we apply it in our lives. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the book of Esther, um, it is an amazing story of salvation for God's people and how he uses Esther to really change their destiny. It opens up with a mega party. As the first chapter begins, man, they are having a great time. The king has thrown this amazing party, and it says that they're even serving in gold glasses. Now, how many of y'all have ever been to a party where they're serving in 24 karat gold glasses? None of you, me either, but I want to go to that kind of a party. And it says that they were partying for 180 days. Absolutely crazy. It says that seven days in the king was a bit merry with wine, or for those of us from the South, the king is drunk. He is drunk at that point. He is acting a fool and he calls his queen Vashti to come and join him. Apparently she was a bit of a trophy wife and he wants to show her off to everybody. So she does the unthinkable though in this moment, I guess knowing and sensing what's going on. She actually declines his invitation, which was something that you do not do to a king. But even in the midst of this, God's going to begin to use that as a setup to save his people. So Vashti declines the invitation that she has, which leads to ultimately him being divorced from her. And then as you continue, you on reading in that uh, second chapter. Um, the king actually calls uh, Chris Hansen from The Bachelor, the guy that's the host of The Bachelor. Then he starts an episode of The Bachelor going on. So he calls like 25 ladies and he brings them out. They're all going to be in the courtship for the king. They get them all glammed up and they're all going to get to meet the king. So uh, they're going to start this whole combination of series of will you accept this rose kind of a thing. And they start it out. So they, they get it going. All these ladies start coming there. I'm telling you guys, if you read the Bible, it is better than a modern day reality television series. You don't have to watch them. Thank you, Jesus. Just read the word. I mean, like it is crazy, the stuff that you'll witness there. So they're going back. He's taking them on vacations and helicopters and all kinds of stuff. And then this one young lady begins to be a standout, a young lady named Esther. She's a young, beautiful Jewish woman who was an orphan being raised by a very wise man named Mordecai. And in Esther 2.17, it says, the king loved Esther more than all the women and she won grace and favor in the sight more than all of the other virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So ultimately, Esther gets the crown in this scenario. She accepts his invitation and gets married. I hinted at it earlier, but there's one little secret. She is a Jewish woman. And that wasn't supposed to be in that day and age. She wasn't supposed to necessarily be the queen, but God's positioning her in this place for the salvation of the Jewish people for such a time as this. God has her there for that moment. He's equipping her. This young orphan girl ends up being a powerful woman of God. 
Sticking with our reality TV script for just a moment, this part actually sounds a bit more like a soap opera or Game of Thrones. But in Esther 2.21, it says, In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on the king. So strategically here, what I want you to see is once again, there's a divine appointment going on. Mordecai is there at a place within earshot where he hears about these plans of the traitors to over, overthrow the king, right? So God puts him there in a place where he would be positioned to then go tell Esther, who in turn Esther can tell the king. The king can thwart these plans that are set against him. It gives Esther more favor before the king. It gives Mordecai a good witness before the king because the king knows that Mordecai has his best interest at heart. So God's setting up all of these things. There's gonna be obstacles and challenges in your life. Do you believe that God would set up things for your good and for his glory? I do. We're gonna explore that just a little bit more through the scripture. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be things that are set against you, but God would reveal them. He would protect you. He would guide you. He would direct you because he loves you and you are his children. As you read on into chapter three, there's a guy named Haman. He rides into power under the king and his desire is to have everybody worship him. He wants everybody to call his name. He wants to have the million followers on Facebook or on YouTube. He wants to be the guy that everybody's talking about. He wants them to bow down to him. And sadly, if we're honest, there's a little bit of Haman in all of our hearts. Why do I say that? In our generation, don't we all go online and try to give the best versions of ourselves? We put the good parts out there. We don't go, how many of y'all take pictures, y'all, when you just wake up and you ain't got no makeup on? Come on, Jesus. Anybody, a few, a few are honest, you know, right? But we don't do that, right? We go take the 10 shots, pick the best shot out, right? And then when we go on vacation, we take all the best pictures of the places that we went on vacation. We didn't talk about the time we stepped in cow poop or something like that, right? That just didn't make it to the timeline, right? We put all of our best feet forward on those kinds of platforms um, for likes, right? We all want somebody to like us. We all want somebody to speak highly of us. And sometimes that can cross the line where we're wanting people to praise us so that we're getting the glory instead of the king of kings getting the glory, right? So Haman clearly crosses the line. In reverse though, don't we do the same thing? We're all looking for someone or something to worship. And sometimes that's not the one true God. We see the people who have a million followers on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, or we see the big celebrities that are out there and we oogle and ogle over them. Or we look at our friends and what's seemingly going on in their lives and in their marriages and in the cool vacations they're taking. And then we go out there and we look at those things and then we're like comparing to the Joneses and then we feel all inadequate in our own lives and in our own marriages when we've got to remember they're putting their best foot forward all the time, right? You didn't see the dirty laundry arguments going on. Come on, Jesus, right? You missed that part. They didn't put that out there, but they give us this false image of who they are, yet we worship those images. You see, the devil has this tactic that he's used throughout all of history, and Haman was but a symptom of it. See, the devil definitely wants us all to worship him, but he's pretty smart. He doesn't turn us all into Satan worshipers directly, does he? None of y'all were out last night like wearing red suits and horns and devil worshiping music. I bet if we asked the room, there were not very many people, if at all, that were outright blatant Satan worshipers. Most of the time, he's content, even if he doesn't fully get the worship, as long as the one true God does not get the worship. So he'll put objects of affection in our life, be it human beings or other things, to distract us and grab our attention so that we'll worship those false things instead of worshiping the one true God. And in that, he gets the victory. Let me describe how that plays out just a little bit through a few different scenarios. Let's take a scenario like addiction. Most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go grab a needle and inject myself with heroin, right? It doesn't happen that way. 
Usually what happens is at some point in their life, maybe a little bit earlier on in their life, they dabble with something, right? So they'll go out there and maybe like my situation, there was a girl that I liked and I wanted to be cool. So, I, and it wasn't Mary Jo. Um, this is pre-Mary Jo. Um, she never did that. Thank you, Jesus. She directed me in the right direction. Um, but I wanted to smoke weed so that I could fit in and be cool and be around them. So then I smoked a little bit of weed, right? Or then maybe it happened with that first drink, right? That you go out there and they don't start by telling you, if you go out there and drink five of these tonight, you're going to be puking and worshiping the porcelain God tomorrow morning. They don't tell you that, right? They don't tell you that, right? They're like, here, try this. And how many of y'all know beer is nasty? It's just gross. Some of you are some of you're shaking your hands, some of you are not. Come on. They do not have non-alcoholic beer crawls. Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, the reason that people drink that stuff is because of the alcohol content in it, right? So we taste it, and at first, maybe with that one, we might reject it. But with most sins, it's enticing at first. So we did that. We drank that first drink. We smoked that little of weed, and it felt really good. And we wanted to do it again. But unfortunately, with things like addiction and other objects of worship for our affection in our lives, you try to get back to that first place and it doesn't work again. You need to do twice as much the next time to try to get back to that same place, right? So then maybe you've already drank some and you've smoked something and now somebody puts a little bit of white powder before you and then you're willing to do that because you're already inebriated and then that takes you to a place where, man, this feels good. But before you know it, that substance is controlling your entire life. You can't get away from it. You're living for that. You can't get by without it any longer. It has control of you. You are now worshiping that thing rather than worshiping God. And then the devil has won in that instance. So sometimes he uses that taste of sin in order to get that good thing and change it into a bad thing from the get-go, right? Other times he'll, he, he's in, uh, he'll use any opportunity. So maybe he'll get somebody that goes and gets in a car accident. And because of that car accident or that other kind of accident, they have to begin taking opiate-based pills like OxyContin. And then the devil will exploit that. And because they've got to start taking it medically, and then in the crazy world we live in, heroin's actually cheaper than buying the pills from the pharmaceuticals. So then people get addicted to it. And then before they know it, they're on heroin. And then as jacked up as our minds end up getting in those kinds of states, if the heroin kills somebody, that's the one that people want to do more. How messed up can we get? So maybe your thing was an addiction. Maybe it was some, something else, right? So maybe there's this shiny new car that drives by. Ooh, that car is so pretty, right? And you're like, oh, I got to go check out that car. So then you go over to the car dealership, and then they spray some funky new car smell kind of stuff in there that's highly addictive. And you get that first whiff of that stuff. And you're like, oh, oh my God, right? And then all of a sudden, you lose all of your senses, and instead of asking the question, how much does that car cost? They deceive you and they say something like, how much would you like your monthly payment to be, right? <laughs> Y'all never heard this? If you're smart, you'll ask the opposite. It's not how much the monthly payment is going to be. How much does that car cost? Because what they do is they deceive you. And then in today's day and age, they say the average car loan is starting to approach seven years. So whatever that monthly payment is, now they lock you in for seven years. And before you know it, you're now worshiping the God of debt that has enslaved you. And about a month later, that new car smell has all gone away. And they really don't bottle it and you can't get it again. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> right? But then we're enslaved and then all of a sudden we want to give to advance the kingdom of God. And we don't have the resources or we got to work 24-7 and then we're too tired to read the Bible. Or we got to work 24-7 and then we can't show up at a small group. And the devil us and he tricks us and he keeps us from God's best plan for our life. So sometimes he uses that more direct approach like Haman is, just come and worship me. But more often than not in our generation, he uses things like comfort and entertainment and lust of the eyes to try to enslave us and keep us from God's plan for our life. But what can we do to be successful and overcome, right? Esther 3, 13, Mordecai refuses to bow down to what Haman is saying. 
So not only does Haman get mad at him, he ends up wanting to kill all of the Jews. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the Jews, young and old, women and children, and one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, to plunder their goods as well. The devil's plans have not changed. In the Old Testament, he wants to annihilate the Jews. In our day and age, he wants to kill us as Christians. He wants to annihilate us. He wants to keep us from God's best in our life. And ultimately, he wants to see us dead. We need to remember and be ever cognizant of the fact that we are in a spiritual battle. He wants to lull us into the fact that we're not. He wants you playing on that iPhone all day and night. He wants to keep you obsessed with what's ever on television. He wants to do anything he can to distract you from being in God's word, from being in the fellowship with other believers, from advancing your life and unlocking your God-given potential. He will do everything he can, but we cannot let him get the victory. Can I get an amen? Amen. We cannot let him win because you were called for such a time as this. There's a potential that is within you that God wants to unlock this very morning. And like Esther and like Mordecai, you can be successful. But where does that success start? They describe it in Esther 4.1. When Mordecai learns all that has been done, he tears his clothes and puts on sackcloth and ashes. And he goes out into the midst of the city and he cries out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate. For no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And so many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. So what does he do? He sees the problem and he goes to the Lord in spiritual warfare. He knows the victory would not be his. The victory would be the Lord's. We've seen this repeated time and time again. Remember uh, the story that Kevin told of Nehemiah last week, right? Nehemiah hears of a city that is in distress, the city of Jerusalem. He hears that his people are in distress and the city is in disrepair. And what does he do? He does the same thing that Mordecai does. He gets on his knees. He begins to fast. He begins to pray. He begins to intercede. And then he begins to take action. Like we're going to do in a few weeks on Thursday night when we gather together to worship and pray and pack out those backpacks. The devil wants to keep people in poverty. The devil wants to keep people where they can't learn. We as God's people could go pray and intercede for our schools. We can go pray and intercede for our teachers and for our students. We could take action by getting backpacks as they got bricks. We can get backpacks. We can go put them on these kids back in the name of Jesus. Remind them of who loves them. Remind them of who cares for them. Would we be that kind of a people where we see the challenges? Don't we see it all around us? I certainly hear a whole lot of complaint. Let me start that over. I certainly hear a whole lot of complaining, but not a whole lot of praying. On a corporate level, I hear complaining about, oh, Obama was all this bad stuff. Now Trump's all this bad stuff. And health care is this stuff. And our society's falling to the birds. And da-da-da-da-da-da. This is happening in my life. And that's happening in my life. If we spent half the time praying that we do complaining, could you imagine the breakthroughs that we might get in our lives? And then double dip. Why do we wait till it's so bad before we start praying? Why not pray now and plow the ground while things are good? You see, sadly, there's this thing that I generally always pronounce wrong, but happens in addiction circles that we talk about that I think happens in a lot of other areas of life. Most human beings will not change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Think that through for a minute. Maybe I'll have to put that online later, but... We're comfortable and content in whatever pain we have until it gets to a level that's just completely unbearable. Then we go do what we should have done in the first place. We cry out to God, we ask him for help, and then usually he shows up and delivers, right? What would happen if we lowered that pain threshold and started the spiritual warfare much earlier? How different might life be? So I would ask you to join me in praying and fasting and weeping over the brokenness in our city, in our church, in our own lives. 
Watch what God would do. We could start that today before we go and continue it on in our homes, continue it on in our corporate prayer nights like that first Thursday in August. Would that be what we're known for as a church? You were born in this day and age. You were placed here in this city with God's potential inside of you for such a time as this. What happened in their day and age when they got on their knees? Mordecai tells Esther she needs to go tell the king. But if, you summon, if you're not summoned by the king, then you get executed. So it's a very precarious situation. Esther 4.12. They told Mordecai what Esther had said. And Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than any of the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come from the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him to do. This young orphan girl is now positioned as the wife of the king. She's positioned with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and anointing on how to save her people. God planted her there for such a time as this. And he's planted you here for such a time as this. Now, you might be saying right now, everything's very good in my life, Eric. All stuff's going good. I'm not too worried. I don't want to get out there and engage in the battle. Yeah, I see stuff that's going on bad out there, but man, life is good for me. Remember what he told Esther. Don't think that you're going to be spared. The devil's tactic is exactly the same. Maybe he's given you a momentary reprieve, but guess what? He's going to come try to take you out. I promise you. He's going to do it. There's no not engaging in the battle. We need to all do it. Some of us walked in here defeated, not believing that we have any potential locked up inside of us because the people in our past have told us that we don't have any or the decisions that we've made have positioned us where we feel like we have few. But let me tell you, God has something special locked inside of each of us. If we'll only begin to walk in it, what would he do? Let me read you the rest of the story of what ends up happening. I'm not going to read it verse for verse. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So when I first read it, they said that on a particular date, they were going to attack the Jewish people. The Jewish people had no ability to defend themselves. So Esther ends up being positioned where she goes to see the king. The king welcomes her into this conversation. And he says, what do you want? How can I help you? And she begins to plea for her people. She begins to plea that God would protect them. But there's one big problem. When you've issued a decree as a king, it's irreversible. That day is going to come. They have permission to go attack them. The Jewish people could still be annihilated, right? But what ends up happening is the element of surprise is taken away. And God tells them, or, or the king ends up issuing an edict whereby they're allowed to defend themselves. So they know on the day in which the attack is going to come, they're prepared for the attack. And the Jewish people end up rising up and defeating their enemies and are saved as a result of all this positioning of God. Praise be to God. He positions them to succeed. Haman, who wanted to be that object of worship, he's pretty arrogant in what he does. He still hates Mordecai. He goes and he builds some gallows in which he pledges that he's going to hang Mordecai from those gallows. So one of the things that Esther does in God-given wisdom is she tells the king that she wants to invite Haman there to this party that they're getting ready to have. So the king remembers what happened with Mordecai and how Mordecai had protected him. Haman starts to talk to him. Haman thinks that He's going to be the object of affection at this party. And the king starts to share to him about all the stuff that Mordecai did. And let's make Mordecai the special guest at the party. So Haman's getting all furious, as you might imagine, right? And then Esther uses that as an opportunity to tell the king of Haman's plans and how he was evil and trying to go kill her people. And he ends up getting hanged on the very gallows that he had hoped that Mordecai would go. What the enemy intends for evil, God turns around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. See, the devil right now has plans to take you out. How good is it to know that God has your back? 
How awesome is it to know that God, if we pray, if we engage in spiritual warfare, if we seek him, that God will position the right people about you who will hear that person that's trying to do you wrong at work, that you'll be positioned to overcome that. How good is it to know what the enemy is intending for evil? God will turn around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let me begin to wrap it up with this. For such a time as this, we've talked about that potential. The devil tries to thwart it in our lives. He tries to keep us from it. But that God gives us a few beautiful things in his word. There's one analogy that he gives us um, of the mustard seed and the mustard tree. How many of you might have heard that story before? You heard about the faith of a mustard seed, right? If you haven't, I mean, go go Google it. Go check it out. It's a pretty amazing set of scriptures. And, And the summary of it is that God says in his word that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, that its potential seems incredibly small, but if we would have faith of even that kind of size that God could deliver on our our behalf, that God can turn that into an amazing tree, like one of the biggest, most powerful, most sturdy trees of all the trees that are out there on the planet, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I ain't never seen a mustard tree, have you? I mean, I just haven't seen, no, I mean, I live in Florida. And Florida, one of the things that we're known for is pine trees. There are pine trees every, how many of y'all drive by pine trees on a daily basis, right? I mean, there's pine trees everywhere. How many of you suffer from allergies from the pine tree? Come on, like you're, there's pine trees everywhere. So I was reading uh, the oddest of places. I was reading a book on economics and, and this book of economics, this guy got into incredible details about the power of a pine tree. And it became fascinating to me. I was like, wow, this is actually incredible. Um, I think they have an image that they're gonna begin to show of a pine forest up there in a second, but um, in Florida, you drive by them and you see like the one trees that are closest to the road. But when you get to see these mountainscapes, like it's just utterly beautiful. Don't trees look so much more cool when they're on the side of a mountain instead of here in Florida? where our garbage dumps are like the highest thing that we have. I mean, these are beautiful. So they have these trees that are going up there and you can see them. And in this book, he describes this scenario whereby in places where pine trees begin to inhabit them, they consume well over 90% of the surface area very quickly. They become the predominant tree in whatever area they possess. You could see that. All you could really see there is pine trees, except at the very top, I think around 12,000 feet in elevation, the oxygen gets so thin that pine trees and most other trees cannot grow at that elevation. But in those lower elevations, you can see that the pine trees have absolutely 100% dominated that particular area. So how do they do it? Um, Pine trees in and of themselves are not that great of a tree by themselves. In fact, um, they're one of the most flammable of trees. Like if you go cut a pine tree, they have uh, the sap that comes out. If you light a pine tree on fire, man, it will burn like there's no tomorrow. Um, If a pine tree's top foliage does catch on fire, a pine forest can go up in flames. But many of the pine trees actually don't have branches that are low. If you go look at the pine trees, the next time you drive by, the majority of the branches are actually very high. So when you get into this area where these these other plants that have this low brush, they actually even in our area do something called a controlled burn, where they burn all the under stuff off, but the pine canopies are never actually touched. So in fires and other things that you would think would wipe them out, the flames often don't even reach the top. They wipe out other plants that are there and then the pine trees continue to grow. And where do they start to get that? They start to get the power inside of the pine cone, the mustard seed. These are a few that fell on my front yard yesterday when that crazy windstorm came through, right? But get this, how amazing God is. There are certain kinds of pine trees that when they release their pine cone, the seeds do not come out until after a fire goes through. The fire actually causes it afterwards, it acts as a protective agent, then it opens up and then the seeds are released after the fire. In the same way, you and I, guess what? There's fires in your life that God has brought you through that the victory, that the fruit of which is not gonna be seen until you, after you get through the fire. How amazing is that? 
all the trouble you've gone through, all the challenges that you think maybe disqualified you from being used from God that might have stunted your potential actually might be releasing it as you get through that circumstance. Yeah, you're welcome to clap at that. As you overcome, you become nothing but more resilient. And then you release that potential that God has within you. How amazing is that? There's a guy I listened to in a sermon not long ago when, when Mary Jo and I were out of town. And he was talking about family and he was talking about leaving a legacy. And he brought up the scriptures where it talked about 10 generations of cursing to those who don't follow after Christ. And 10 generations of blessing for those who do who pass on this legacy of Christianity from one generation to the next generation. And he began to speak of the kind of impact that that could make. And the data was unfathomable when he began to talk about it. He said, if we're the average American family and you have your 2.2 kids and then they have 2.2 kids and they have 2.2 kids, it takes but a few generations before there are 57,000 of you running around. Inside of you is locked a small city. Come on, Jesus. But think about that for a minute. If we lead our lives in this way, the potential to impact the generations just within our own families. I don't know exactly how many seeds are locked up within here, but let's be random and say a hundred, right? Maybe a hundred. These are the people you share your faith with. The people that you invite to come to church or the people you talk about Jesus to at work or in your neighborhood could be that person you invite on Friday night to come out to the movies. They come and see, I can only imagine, and their hearts are ignited with God's love. That seed has been planted and then it begins to take fruit and then they become another tree. And before you know it, we're a forest like you see up there in those pictures, a beautiful, glorious forest that's overtaking 90% of the earth with Christianity and the story of Jesus and how he came to save us and deliver us and set us free. How amazing is that? The potential that's within each of us to make it even through the harshest of times and thrive. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? See, sometimes those circumstances and challenges are thrust upon us from outside forces that are trying to steal our joy and trying to steal our testimony. Other times it's a series of bad decisions that we've made on our own as we've pursued what scripture would call false gods or idols that are not Jesus, but that we've come to obsess over and fall in love with that are actually holding us back from our relationship with Christ doesn't matter what the past has been. All that matters is this moment that God can change us and transform us. And it's actually his desire to do so. He loves us so much that he would send his one and only begotten son to die a sinner's death on the cross that we might have life. My life was forever changed on May 31st of 1992 when I committed my life to him and said, from this day forward, Lord, I will serve you with everything that's within me. It didn't mean all my problems would go away because certainly I created more of my own after that. Certainly there were challenges, but now I had the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding to help me through those difficult times, to bring me to the place where I am today. So I would ask you, have you ever made that commitment? Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus and said, God, I need you. God, will you forgive me? God, will you set me free? Many seeds may have been planted in your past that want to be germinated today. Some of you, you've made that commitment, but as life circumstances have flooded over you or you've made those kinds of bad decisions that I've said, You've realized that those things have pulled you further away from God than closer to him. And today, as you sit here, you're like, man, I I just want to rededicate my life to Christ. I need to do that today. I want to live for him. I want to achieve my full potential in him. So if you're of either of those two groups, I promise you there's nothing I want to do to embarrass you at all. But I would love to pray with you and for you. Nobody's looking around right now, but if that's you and you know you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God today, would you do me a favor and just hold your hand up real high so I could see it? I see yours, sir. Thank you, Lord. I see yours, ma'am, and yours, sir. There may be others that I haven't seen. I'm getting old. I need some new eyes. Come on, Jesus. 
Man, if you raised your hand, I am so proud of you. I am so excited for you. I want to encourage you to do something. It might sound scary again, but I promise you I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. But I do want to pray for you and with you. If you raised your hand, would you do me a favor and just run right up here to the front? I'd love to pray with you. Everybody else around you is going to clap for you. So if you raise your hand, come on up here. Dude, I'm fired up for you. So glad you're here today, man. Stay right here. I'll pray for you. God bless you, man. So glad you're here. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Come right over here. I think there are more. Come on up here, ma'am. God bless you. So glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Woo, Father, we are excited. You are, you are unlocking some things today, and we couldn't be more happy this morning to stand with these brothers and sisters who have walked up here, who are making a declaration of faith, and we just stand alongside of them as their faith family, and we pray for them, even as we pray for ourselves. And I just want to encourage those who came up, don't immediately go back to your seats, but there's going to be someone near you that would love to give you a few next steps to help you out with your walk of faith. If your family's here, I promise promise you they'll get you right back. And Lord, we just come before you with those who have come up and we just rejoice as you are rejoicing and saying, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again. We love you. We will worship you from this day forward and forevermore. We can't thank you enough for forgiving us. We can't thank you enough for setting us free. We can't thank you for your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We fully, wholly, totally submit ourselves to you. We ask you to unlock the seeds of potential that you planted in our heart. Father, help us to fulfill our calling and you help us to not be distracted by the things of the world, Lord God, as the devil tries to put things in our path to keep us from our destiny in you. Lord, would you help us to keep our focus? Would you keep us directed on the things that matter? Would we not bow down to the gods of entertainment? Would we not bow down to the gods of comfort or addiction or lust? Lord, would you give us a ready defense against those things? Would we be powerful and mighty and advancing the kingdom of God in our generation? Lord, we've gathered together here to worship you. We thank you for honoring your word and bringing some unto salvation today. Lord, would you continue to work in and through the people of Journey Church that we would become a mighty forest that brings you glory and demonstrates your majesty to the world around us. And I just want to encourage you, we're going to have one more song of worship today. If you'd like during that song, the communion tables will be open to both my left and my right. You're welcome to come on up and take communion. If you'd like to be prayed for or with, if something's going on in your life, myself, other leaders will be up here. We'd love to pray with you and intercede with you. If you want to pray all by yourself, you're welcome to kneel down up here at the front as well. Just take a couple more moments to worship God before we go, then I'll fall formally dismiss. Give these folks one more big round of applause. God bless you guys. Let's worship our Lord and King.
have an insecurity today, if you have depression or inadequacy or inferiority, you just look to the cross, the empty cross, where our help comes from, where our, our validation is in Jesus. We don't fear man. We belong to God. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You have for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Journey Church. If you're new, you want to get more information about any of the events that we shared today or are ready to take some next steps like water baptism, be sure to stop by our next step booth before you go. If you're new, I'd love to meet you. Come on up and say hello. It'd be great to welcome you and your family. And if you're going to our leadership class, we're going to get started shortly. So make your way to the annex. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Go live for Jesus.